was beautiful. Welcome, I am Pastor Melody Simpkins, so blessed to have you here today. Can you believe that Palm Sunday is next week and we will start Holy Week? So I want to lift up some of those times for you. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday. We have our normal schedule, 8.45, 10 in here and 11 in the sanctuary. But then on Monday, Thursday, we have a noon service, and at 6 p.m. we have a Seder meal that we need you all to register for if you are interested, and then a 7 o'clock worship service. Then on Good Friday, we have a 10 a.m. children's service, a noon service, the seven last words, and then a 7 p.m. service as well. That is Good Friday. And then Easter, Easter, what a celebration. It will start at 7.30 if you want to wake up really early for a sunrise service. And we do that by the fountain. And it is just lovely. It's a really small service. But you are all welcome to beat the crowd and come then. And then we have our normal schedule as well, 8.45, 10 in here. But then we also have a 10 a.m. children's service uh, in the pit and 11 o'clock. I would suggest, since you guys are normal attenders, to come early. Just to say, <laughs> I would suggest to come early. So all are welcome. Just keep advised. If you need the nursery, we ask that you do RSVP for that in advance so we know how many kids to expect. Please stand, and we will continue in song. be seated. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Picture yourself right out of college and you're applying for your first real job. You have sent out so many resumes and applied for so many jobs and have gone on so many interviews that you can't keep it straight in your head anymore. Now you find yourself at a job interview and you don't know exactly what you applied for. You're sitting in front of a huge desk of the senior vice president of some major corporation. And while you're waiting for him in his office, you quickly read over the job description and you think, why in the world are they even letting you interview for the executive senior management director of this Fortune 500 company? You don't even have any of the qualifications, so you're going through them. 
Their qualifications are you must have a master's degree, 15 years plus experience in management, and references from at least one CEO of a major corporation. You're about to walk out the door and the VP walks in and he welcomes you with a warm smile and the VP calmly asks, let me see your resume. That's it. You know he'll take one look at your resume and escort you out the door. So he starts to look at it. Hmm. Hmm. I see you just graduated from undergrad in art history degree. <laughs> close enough. Close enough. And I see, oh, you do have experience waiting tables part-time at the local diner. That will work. And your references, oh, you don't have any? That's okay. So before you know it, you, he has offered you the job and wants you to start immediately. Well, you know this scenario is absurd. It will never happen. Life doesn't happen like this. There's only two ways you could get a job like at this out of college. Either, either your parents own the company or the subversive hope of God. And that's what we're talking about today in our sermon series, where we're talking about how God's nature is completely upside down from the rest of the world. The last shall be first, the weak shall reign, the ultimate power is shown in dying on a cross. So let's take a look at our gospel from, for today. From Luke chapter 5. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in a boat and taught the crowd from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where the water is deeper and let down your net to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, We worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so... I'll let the nets down again. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout from help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him, his partners James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid, for now on you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and follow Jesus. Jesus was at the beginning of his public ministry here. Jesus was God made man. He was a healer and miracle worker, but he was also a teacher. And the people called him rabbi. And the rabbis of the day would study scripture. They would ponder it and discuss it in depth. They would teach the people. And the good rabbis, the best rabbis, would have disciples that would follow them around and learn from them. In Jesus' days, kids went to school like they do now. And then there was elementary school called Beth Sh Sh Sheriff, Sh uh, Chef, or Sheffer. There we go, Beth Sheffer. This was more like an elementary school 
where the kids learned to read and write, and they focused in on the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. And when they were done with this elementary school, most of the ch Jewish children stopped at that time. But the best, maybe the top 10%, and only the boys went on to the next level, more like a secondary school. And everyone else stayed behind. They would go back home, start working, or learn a trade. So the de secondary school was only the top students, the outstanding students. But then when they finished the secondary school, they took the best, the valedictorians, the top, top students, and they would become a disciple of the rabbi, and they would walk around and learn from them. Now these were the smartest. These were the brightest in the community, and it took a lot to be a disciple. But these kids were not who Jesus called to follow him. He called fishermen. And like the life of a fisherman was hard, especially in Jesus' day. It was difficult. It was back-breaking work, and it was even a little stinky. Yes, it didn't take much education to be a fisherman. It didn't take a genius mind. It took someone who was hardworking, someone with patience. A fisherman was someone willing to get their hands dirty. This same qualifications wouldn't apply to a disciple. These men, these fishermen, seem like the least likely to carry on the message of Jesus Christ. Now, think of these disciples. It wasn't just to learn from Jesus, but then they were called to go out and share that message, that message that would still continue 2,000 years later. You would think that Jesus would choose the best of the best. But yet, he chose fishermen. Fishermen to do the ministry of Christ. There are sometimes people in our lives that look at each other and think that they can't do ministry. Maybe they think they're too inexperienced. Maybe they're too old. Maybe they're too young. But that reminds me of our Generous Living Project we challenged our middle schoolers to this fall. In September, Pastor Scott gave out these envelopes to our youth. And in the envelopes was either a $20 bill, a $50 bill, and a $100 bill. And we gave them uh, this money and said, your job is to make an impact for the kingdom of God. To make an impact for the kingdom of God. Now, I have heard some amazing stories about how these youth had gone out, they made more money, and made a huge impact for the kingdom of God, long-lasting impact for the kingdom of God. Now, there's one I would like to share with you. Rebecca Schweitzer was given $50 in her envelope. And what she did was, with this $50, she went and made soap and some jewelry. And she came here to church and sold it. With that $50, it became $700. And with that money, she sent it to South Sudan to build a well and bring education about hygiene and how to use this water properly. And she did amazing, amazing work. And there is great things happening in South Sudan just because of this one youth. But we didn't have one youth that did stuff. We had about 50 youth making an impact for the kingdom of God. And 
this 50 kids did about the same thing that Rebecca did. So it's hard for me to even imagine the impact that that Genesis Living Project made. So why did Jesus call these youth to ministry? Why did Jesus call fishermen to be their disciples? I think it comes down to a willing heart. A willing heart. So let's talk about what a willing heart for a disciple is. When Jesus asked his disciples, well, men at those time, fishermen, to let their nets down one more time in deeper water, what they said was, but if you say so, but if you say so. Now, I hear these words a lot from one of my five children, at least once a day. And these words come more like, ugh if you say so, and there's eye rolling involved. And it, they truly mean, I don't really want to argue with you, but I want you to know that I'm not happy about doing whatever you're talking about. I want you to know. I ask them to take out the trash, Ugh, if you say so. I ask them to do their homework, if you say so. I ask them to clean their room, if you say so. It sounds like they're not quite 100% willing to do it, doesn't it? Well, the disciples had a long day fishing. They had been fishing all night long. They had already cleaned their nets. And then here comes Jesus, and he wants to borrow their boat so he can teach from it. And then he asks them to go fishing again. I bet they were just exhausted. But they still listened to Jesus. And that same thing could be said about our youth. I'm sure they had 101 other things that they could be spending their time doing instead of furthering the kingdom of God. They might have done it because this project was giving them a requirement for confirmation. Or maybe their parents made them. Or maybe they just felt guilty because their pastor was pushing them into it. But they were doing it. They were doing it willingly. And those words of the disciples, there was a lot of exhaustion in those words. But if you say so, is also words of obedience. The disciples were willing. They had a willing heart. And with a willing heart comes commitment, passion, dedication, and drive. And these characteristics aren't found in a textbook. They aren't gained by experience or references. They aren't learned in school. A willing heart is something that comes with a calling. And when I think of calling, I think of Moses and the burning bush or Samuel asleep and God waking him up by his calling. Or there are these fishermen that seem a sea, all the fish come in and see ultimate abundance. But very few people hear the call story and have a call story that alters their life. Very few people hear God's voice calling to them, speaking to them into ministry. Yet, we are all called call to follow Jesus in daily life. At our baptism, after the water was poured, after the promises were made, after God claimed each and every one of us, after we were forgiven, after we have given gift of the Holy Spirit, the congregation comes and surrounds this individual, and they close with some words. Let me read those for you. We welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, and most importantly, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. So we just had a baptism at the first service, 
And this little guy was about four months old. And he's being called to be a worker for the kingdom of God here at this little age. And if he is called into ministry, so are you. So are you. But being called, it must be scary. Jesus asked these disciples to drop their nets and follow him. Now, I can't imagine fishermen of the day being very rich. They probably live day to day or week by week wondering if they will um, have enough food on the table for their family. And all of a sudden, they had abundance. Their boats were about to sink. They had more than enough. They also had their family there to surround them. It was a family business. They were out fishing with their father. And Jesus asked them to leave this security, leave this abundance, to step out of their comfort zone and follow the Savior, to drop everything and follow him. But he didn't do this not knowing what they were getting into. He said, don't be afraid. He knew this was a scary calling. It's scary to do ministry. It takes time out of our day. It takes time out of our lives. It calls us to live differently. And that is a scary thing. Don't be afraid. And we're asked in our baptism also to follow Jesus. But not only are we given the gift of the Holy Spirit, God with us wherever we go, we are given the gift of the community that surrounds us in our ministry. A few weeks ago, we got these stickers that we handed out, and I think we still have a few here and there, to help us remember our baptism every time we touch water, every time we brush our teeth, every time we wash our face, we remember our baptism. Well, today I want you to remember your mission and your calling. So, I want you to look at each other and repeat after me that saying that we say after those that were baptized. So we remember that we are called into ministry together. So will you repeat after me? We welcome you into the Lord's family. We welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ. We receive you as a fellow member of the body of Christ. A child of the same Heavenly Father a child of the same Heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. A worker with us in the kingdom of God. Amen.
want to take this time to introduce you to Amy Daniels. She is a deacon in our church and also the director of outreach. Good morning, everybody. I have a question first. If you have ever volunteered or do now volunteer with McPi, raise your hand. Keep it up. If you've ever donated to Freedom School or Christmas shopping or the Feed a Family program or McPie, add your hand. You need to look around. There's a lot of folks. This is part of our mission. McPie stands for McClinic Partners in Education. And I um, have helped put together a video that I cannot show you but it's being shown in other worship services at the time of the offering, so you could go online to any service this afternoon and check it out, because it would help you tell the story of McPie to other folks that you know. Um, and you might find yourself in the video if you've been a volunteer. The mission of McPie is to create future stories, to support families, to inspire volunteers, to build community, all so that every McClinic student can succeed. McClinic is middle school right around the corner, less than three miles from here, literally just on the other side of the tracks. And everything we do, have done, and will do is about relationships. Christ Lutheran Church reached out because of our relationship with our Creator God and Redeemer Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, that partnership was born 15 years ago in the spring of 2007. From the beginning, God was already inside the school building. In our trying to be the hands and feet of Christ, we met his heart and saw him in the eyes of families and counselors and administrators and faculty and staff, each following a call to be at that place at that time so that relationships could form. All of us grew in faith by whatever name we called it. All of us loved and serving together to creating those future stories, building community. We met students and families, parents along the way. We found Christ's very soul in them. Parents who took sacrifice a step further, wanting something more for their children, willing to be vulnerable and open to these strangers, these outsiders, in hopes that together we could all grow and that a better world would be formed, especially for their children. My world is better because of the gifts of the relationships with volunteers, with students, families, staff, all that have been shared with me in that community. My faith has grown. My heart is more tender, and I have seen amazing people doing remarkable things for youth. Now I'm even beginning to hear from youth that are adults who come back to say thank you, to serve, to pay back, and to pay forward. We've had tremendous leadership in the school. Mr. McHugh, the principal, has been there for six years. We bid him the very best as he's moving on to another um, career move, um, but we know he was so ethical. He led with heart and mind, and he did what was in the best interest of his staff, his students, their families. So we pray for another leader just like that. Next year, next week, you should get a newsletter in the mail all about McPie celebrating the 15 years of this ministry. I hope after this service you'll take the long trek all the way over and down into Lower Commons. We have donuts from OMG Bakery. They are worth the walk. And it'll be good, right? You see, walk there, you'll get the donut. I mean, it'll work. That uses all the calories. Um, OMG Bakery is on Monroe Road right across from East Mech. So it's in that corridor, which we're trying to celebrate with our festivities for 15 years. I've got nifty pins that say McPie 15 years. We'd love to see you. And we have a 3D printer working that Mr. Gorman, um, the STEAM coordinator at the school, is there to talk to you, talk about some of the special programs and how our partnership with all the STEAM focus at the school has earned it the distinction of a magnet school of excellence. There are only 121 schools in the entire nation that have won that honor this year. McClinic is one. Um, so I hope that you'll join us. I hope you'll take a look at the 
insert in your bulletin, and then be on the lookout for that newsletter in the next week or so. Thank you, Amy. Let us pray for the world, the church, and all those in need, kneeling or sitting as we are able. Heavenly and Almighty Father, we learn from the fishermen that we don't need qualifications. We don't need education. We just need a willing heart to be your disciple. Enable us, empower us, put a light that burns in our hearts on fire for your ministry. In Jesus' name, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up the ministries of our middle school youth, the Living Generous Project, and all who are affected by it. We lift up to you the people of South Sudan who were affected by the well and the water education. Lord, please continue to bless our youth with outstanding ministry and the confidence to go out into the world to share your good news. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for your church that we may be the hands and feet of you in this world. We lift up to you McClintock, partners in education. Let that be a place where your self is revealed through our actions and deeds. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for the world. There's war raging in Ukraine, and we ask that you bring your peace Cover the soldiers with your love, your mercy, and your grace so that they, their hearts may be open to talks of reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you all who are hurting or in need of your prayer, especially Chuck, Stuart, Scott, Dave, Lindsay and Scott. Lord, we pray for Chuck, Klein, Nina, Kathy, Jim. Lord, please be with Don, Janetta, Doug, Judy, Renata, and Jackie. Lord, bring peace to the family and friends who have lost loved ones, especially Willie at the death of his uncle the friends and family of John and Mary Jo. And Lord, we celebrate, we celebrate new life with Annie and Matt at the birth of their new son, Oliver. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, in the name of your son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share that peace with one another as you feel comfortable. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together with the words that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. If you are worshiping with us at home and want to commune, take the bread and hear these words, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take a cup and hear these words, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you are worshiping with us here today, an usher will invite you forward, and you may put your hands out. We will place a wafer in your hand, and then you may dip it into the red wine or white grape juice. We have gluten-free available here with the golden tray. All are welcome.
please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 